Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Patrick Hedger. I'm the executive director of the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. Um, and we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan taxpayer and consumer advocacy organization based here in Washington, D.C. Again, thank you all for joining us and a special thank you to Senator Braun's office and his staff for securing this space for us. We really appreciate it. Um, so let's get right into it. Uh, death and taxes, right? These are the two givens of the human condition. And in the United States, death and taxes means that the IRS is also a perennial issue for the average American. And that means it's always a public policy issue as well. But the IRS has been more of a focal point of public policy lately, as Congress has just handed the agency $80 billion, which the agency says will in part go towards hiring uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80,000 new agents. Now, even in Washington, with $31 trillion in, $31 trillion in debt and, and huge job numbers in the hundreds of thousands, 80 billion and 80,000 are still big numbers, even in Washington. And in isolation, these numbers would be enough for a group like ours to raise our eyebrows and say, well, hey, wait a, wait a minute, what's going on? What are these resources gonna be used for? But we're not just talking about these figures in isolation because they are also in the context of recent reports of waste, fraud, abuse, and politicization at the agency that's cutting both left and right. As I said, the IRS is, given, is a given in American life, so we should be concerned when an agency of its prominence is given this level of resources, and there are still open questions related to trust, neutrality, and privacy at the agency. No one likes thinking about the IRS in their life, but when it inevitably shows up, Americans should have the confidence that the S in the IRS stands for service, truly stands for service. But you don't just have to take my word for it or our, or our organization's word for it. Uh, so I'm pleased to be joined by this distinguished panel representing three excellent and storied policy organizations here in Washington, DC. Um, each panelist has some prepared remarks uh, on their work related to tax policy and IRS accountability. And then we will follow up with some uh, opportunity for questions and discussion with the panelists. So first I'd like to introduce Nan Swift. She is a resident fellow with the R Street Institute's governance program, where she works for pragmatic free market solutions to sticky economic issues. Previously, Nan was a professional staff member for the Senate Budget Committee and was director of federal affairs for the National Taxpayers Union. She likes to say that she works on behalf of your wallet. So with that, Nan, why don't you take it away? Sure, well, thank you. Um, nope. Thank you so much um, for having me. I'm very happy to um, come and talk about the IRS. Less happy to talk about taxes broadly than I am. Like I usually try to think about that only on April 14th and I do that really quickly and then, then forget about it again. But the IRS is a very um, important issue because as you said, it, had, it plays um, a significant role in the lives of most Americans. Um, I also want to start with um, a common quotation, and that is that power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely, famously written by Lord Acton, British historian. Um, and I think that that's something that you can see throughout um, the history of the IRS. It's not just now that we're hearing stories of politicization, of leaks and um, infringement on the rights of individuals and, and all kinds of problems. This has you know, been a problem for decades, if not many, many, many decades, um, but at least um, the history that I'm more privy to going back to the, the 90s to now, it's been an ongoing problem. Um, and something that the IRS is always trying to do is to get more power. Um, and that's something that I'm here today to say, please do not do that. Please do not give the IRS more power. Um, there's certainly a lot of room for improvement and the IRS should have the tools to do its job effectively and fairly, but it does not need additional authorities to do that. First, of all, the IRS would like to prepare your taxes. And that might sound nice. Um, there's memes that you'll see every day and more and more as we get 
closer and closer to tax day about how it's so unfair that we have to file our taxes and guess the right amount when the IRS already knows what the right amount is, but, um, and, and how that's an extra burden on us. But really, um, it's, well, it shouldn't be burdensome for us to do our taxes. And I know my um, colleague Damien will talk more about it. Being aware and cognizant of the cost of government is an important price that everyone should pay to a degree. Again, it shouldn't be an outrageous burden. But without that little point of discomfort every year where you have to reckon with how much money uh, the IRS has taken from you each year, it's hard, I think, for average people to recognize the real cost of the burden of government. Um, again, should not be a hideous experience by any means, but it should be one that people are aware of. Um, automatic withdrawal of our taxes um, by our employers removes part of that pain point and separates us from the cost and complexity of government. But every year when we have to reckon those things unto ourselves and perhaps pay a little more or see how little um, we're getting back, it is an important reminder that this is, you know, this is what we've paid for. And it's an important way for us to be cognizant of whether this is the size, scope, and um, type of government that we want. Um, also, the IRS is not the best at doing math and flagging things. Errors um, are a constant problem, but because there's such um, an unfair power dynamic between the IRS, who assumes everyone is trying to commit fraud, who is, sets up what is really, really intrinsically an adversarial relationship, um, against all other taxpayers um, really puts anyone who would think that perhaps the IRS didn't calculate this correctly um, at a distinct disadvantage. Um, when you don't have access to time, <laughs> extra money for a tax lawyer, um, time to sit on the phone, um, and the emotional and resource wherewithal to deal with an enormous organization with the full power of the United States government behind it, um, people are not really quick to push back when the IRS does make an error, and they do quite frequently. Um, finally, another place that the IRS would like to get some power is when it comes to licensing tax preparers. Um, on its surface, that might not sound like such a bad idea, but when you think about the true cost um, to both taxpayers and small business people, especially um, on top of the fact that it's unnecessary given the already rigorous um, regulatory regime that um, most tax professionals have to comply with, um, it's, it's not a value add <laughs> for, for any taxpayer. It's only a value add for CPAs, and especially the big firms, um, or for um, other, like for H&R Block and the other really big tax preparer um, companies. Um, the, our friends at the Institute for Justice have been fighting this on an ongoing basis in and out of the courts. It's a power grab that the IRS asks for in just about every federal budget, um, and they've gotten close a couple times, um, but it's really not one that they need. People will complain often about so-called ghost preparers. Well, the thing with criminals is that People are going to be criminals regardless of whether you set up complicated licensing regimes or not. In fact, they might 
uh, do that more so if there's a complicated licensing regime that they have to deal with that's costly, that requires um, ongoing education and, and all kinds of things like that. Um, at the end of the day, the real problem is our tax code is extremely, extremely complicated. It's hard for individuals to uh, decipher. It's hard for tax professionals and IRS employees to decipher. And when we simplify those things and um, make this something that can be approached by average Americans and the agents who are supposed to interpret it, I think we'll all have um, an equal footing when it comes to the power. All right, thank you, Nan. Really appreciate those remarks. Uh, next, I want to go to Mike, Mike Pallets. He is the Director of Tax Policy at Americans for Tax Reform, a Washington-based advocacy and policy research organization founded in 1985 at the request of President Ronald Reagan. Mike is an advocate for lower taxes, less regulation, and free markets. And Mike's going to talk to us about ATR's perspective on these issues. Thanks, Patrick, and thank you for everyone for being here today. Um, I'll use most of my time to kind of expand upon an area Nan touched on, uh, and that's government-run tax preparation, also known as direct e-file. Um, you know, I think there's, this is essentially the idea of having the IRS compete with private uh, organizations, think TurboTax, Tax Act, um, on, on filing your taxes. Um, so a couple of things I'd like to highlight as concerns for why a taxpayer organization should be concerned about this, or why your office or your boss should be concerned about this. Um, right off the bat, I think the number one concern we would have is the conflict of interest we'd have with the IRS, where essentially now you'd have the same agency responsible for managing contested tax returns, also responsible for filing your tax return for you. So you have the same person being the tax prepper and the auditor and the uh, managing contested returns. I think there's a clear conflict of interest there that everyone should be concerned of regardless of political ideology. Um, within this uh, as well, what would be additional concern would be the additional reporting requirements. Um, you know, we have center right organizations up here now, even more progressive leaning organizations, the uh, Progressive Policy Institute specifically comes to mind, uh, has warned over the specific concerns would have over the earned, in, uh, earned income tax credit, where essentially the IRS just does not have the reporting information uh, it would need, uh, it would require to, to do EITC credits uh, resp uh, responsibly fairly. Um, you know, essentially also warning that we'd have a, a tax trap on lower income individuals who would report, uh, who would claim the credit less because of the IRS's uh, increased involvement. Um, in addition to the increased uh, burden on reporting, um, I think something that could obviously a conflict, uh, something that's been uh, in the news recently, we just had the idea of giving the IRS more information at this time, where we've had the two uh, pro publica thefts and then reported leaks recently. Um, I think there's broad concern from the center right over this specifically, where we've had you know, earlier back, it's been 650 plus days since the first pro publica story uh, reporting, I think June 2021, um, that seemed politically timed as well, where we've had right at the start of kind of the Build Back Better rollout uh, the president making his case for wealth tax is when we have targeted stolen taxpayer information, not just their tax return, but their full filing information given to ProPublica to publish uh, publicly. Uh, just in her uh, Senate hearing last week, uh, Secretary Yellen has said she has not seen so much as a report on this from the IRS, uh, which should be deeply concerning for everyone, uh, especially on the heels of just la uh, like less a week and a half now, uh, since we had a second ProPublica story this time, right after we've had uh, a renewed push for wealth tax, renewed push for uh, increasing the stock buyback tax. Again, selected leak from uh, published from ProPublica highlighting uh, CEOs' uh, stock transactions that we've had. Um, so the idea, I think, right now of giving the IRS additional reporting information when the IRS has proven it can't safeguard the information it does collect uh, is something we should have deep concerns over uh, and not really be willing to expand the IRS's role in the information we give to it. Um, I think around that as well, I think it's also important to understand that, you know, just the, it's important that we have the IRS complete its core task assigned to it by Congress before seeking to expand its role. Um, so I think, you know, something we should be concerned about, uh, the IRS just, you know, within the last few years that we only know from a Treasury Inspector General, uh, General report, uh, destroyed 30 million ta active taxpayer documents, including 1099Ks. Uh, at its processing facility in Ogdenville, in Ogden, Utah. Um, the IRS has not said how it destroyed these or why it destroyed these. We don't know if they were incinerated, if they were burned, uh, if they were buried out in the backyard somewhere. Uh, but 30 million active taxpayer documents destroyed by the IRS. Um, 
We have no answer as to why that happened. And again, the only reason we know it happened is because an on-site visit from the Treasury Inspector General uh, basically caught them in the act of doing it. Um, again, no answer from Congress, from the IRS, from Treasury as to why that happened. Um, I think the idea that we would increase the IRS's role, give them more information, more workload to do uh, when they're currently destroying the, the work that they do have is, is a, a very troubling sign. Um, I think in addition to this, we've also had a lot of talk around the IRS uh, 1099K reporting. This is the Venmo PayPal story I'm sure a lot of you have seen um, that the IRS has put off for another, uh, I believe, to the end of this year. They haven't put out guidance. So this is something, again, this passed in ARPA back in 2021. It's been more than two years now uh, since the IRS knew it would have to be issuing guidance for 1099Ks. Uh, still has not put that out there. Um, you know, we had, I think, the ex estimate was 20 to 30 million new 1099Ks would go out to independent contractors, to people selling things on Etsy, uh, to anyone who's done a garage sale um, in the last few years, where that burden would be put upon them. Uh, the idea that we would then transfer over to the IRS be the ones automatically reporting that uh, when we have seen that the IRS can't even put out its own guidance with more than two years notice uh, is, is again, it's something we would not seek for them uh, to take on. All right, thank you, Mike. Uh, next, I want to turn to Damian Brady. He is the Vice President of Research uh, for the National Taxpayers Union Foundation, where he produces NTUF's annual tax complexity study and oversees the taxpayers' budget office focused on transparency and budget reforms. Thanks, Ab. Uh, we'll get into some of the aspects of the complexity of our tax code, but first comment a little bit more on the, uh, the idea of the IRS uh, filling out your taxes. It, not only would it be uh, you have the intimidation factor, but there also would be an unfunded mandate on a lot of employers who would have to report the IRS information on their employees' salaries, all that other information on a brand new timetable. It was a couple of years ago, I remember seeing some estimates that the cost of this could run from anywhere from $500 million to several billion dollars to be able to, to get over to the system. And the proponents of uh, Ready File also point to a lot of European countries where they're able to do this successfully, but uh, we have a, a much more complex tax system than, than countries such as uh, Sweden and Denmark, who are the, the gold standards that, that people point to as an exemplar for, for this uh, type of policy. Uh, but uh, uh, back to the points of complexity, our, our tax code, our, the, the price that we pay for, for taxes is, is more than just the amount that we owe on tax day. There's an immense amount of time that goes into preparing your taxes, it includes you know, gathering the information, all the paperwork, your pay stubs, financial documents from, from various sources, and then understanding your tax forms and schedules and trying to read through the, the instructions and make sense of them. Um, it was actually a, a couple days ago, the IRS did put out some preliminary guidance for the 1099K. And uh, if you read through it, it's, it's kind of mind numbing and difficult to, to make sense of. Um, so they're going to need to do some more work on that to, to increase uh, the clarity for the millions and millions of people who are going to be impacted by, by the expansion of the, the lowering of the threshold of the 1099K form. So uh, thanks to um, the Paperwork Reduction Act, all federal agencies are supposed to calculate the time burden and the out-of-pocket burden that it costs to, to comply with any form that the public has to fill out. Um, so the IRS has looked through all their forms and tabulated that it takes um, uh, Americans 6.55 billion hours collectively to comply with the tax code. So this includes individual income taxes, business taxes, estate taxes, and all the, the various other components of the tax code. It's an immense amount of time that's uh, basically a time sink that going into tax compliance rather than into more productive pursuits or, or more leisurely pursuits. And we can quantify this amount by looking at the average cost for private sector later, labor that the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports each year. So it amounts to about $39.60 per hour for a private sector employee, which is up a buck fifty from a year ago, so we get a, a time burden cost of that about two hundred and sixty billion dollars is the value of all that time spent on, on laboring over taxes instead of other things. And then, as I mentioned, in addition, the IRS calculates the out-of-pocket expenses that are incurred for uh, getting software, getting a professional, making copies, all the other sorts of things that go into it. And that adds another. $104 billion. So the net compliance burden for the tax code for this year is $364 billion. And as you can see, it's up from a little bit. And um, we've been tracking this for years and years. So we saw that after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was enacted, which you know, implemented some um, simplification reforms, such as increasing the standard deduction and uh, 
lowering the amount of people who will be impacted by the alternative minimum tax, that we saw the net total of hours decrease from over 8 billion down to 7.8 billion. And then 2020 is a little bit different, uh, as you can see in the stat there. It's $6 billion for that year, I mean, 6 billion hours. That year, the IRS had known for a couple of years that they were overestimating the amount of time it, it took people to comply with the business side of the tax code, but they, were, they waited for a couple of years of the TCGA to roll out before they implemented that new methodology into their model for, for determining the taxpayer burden there. Um, so some of the points of complexity, of, uh, of course, one part is just that it's so immense. Uh, it's difficult to count. Uh, we, we take it every, we use the methodology that the um, taxpayer advocate used to do, which is to take the entire tax code, paste it into Word, uh, and then just let the computer sit there for a few minutes while it counts it, and we come up with over 4.1 million words in the tax code. And uh, the tax code changes frequently. Um, it's On average, there's hundreds of changes to the tax code made every year. Some of these, of course, are more significant than others, but every change could impact the planning that taxpayers have made, businesses have made, estates have made. It impacts the IRS too, because they'll have to uh, update their forms, their schedules, their instructions, their information on their website, and all their databases and operating programs that they have behind the scenes that they use to process all this information. And also, of course, the IRS issues uh, regulations on a, on a regular basis. There's thousands and thousands of pages of regulation in, in, the, um, in code, and then they also issue weekly uh, guidances for, for various uh, parts of, of the tax code and new questions that arise up. Um, so this is one reason why a lot of people will spend out of pocket to go hire a professional to help them with all this. Another is, this, as Nan noted, it's hard to get good information from the IRS. You call in, you get stuck in a busy signal, or you can like, get through to someone and the IRS has lots of different case management systems. So the person you're talking to might not have access to your case file, so you have to be transferred and put on hold for a longer period of time. And then, uh, interestingly, there's vast sections of the tax code that are considered out of scope for telephone assistance. So if you call up and they, they, there's certain things that they just can't give you answers about. And it could be simple things. A couple of years ago, NTF President Pete Sepp called up to the IRS to ask a question about what to do with an employee who was using a car for work. And he was on hold for 40 minutes before uh, an agent came back and said, oh, sorry, we can't, we can't answer that question. So you're uh, kind of, that's why you have to go and spend money out of pocket. We need to do things to make a, a filing as, as simple as possible. So that gets us to where we are today. The IRS has been given this $80 billion and they've done a lot over the last couple of months to highlight the progress that they've uh, made using parts of that money to improve taxpayer assistance so that the backlog that they built up during the COVID shutdown was immense. So they've made good progress there and they're touting other uh, improvements to taxpayer services. But we have to remember that only $3.2 billion of the $80 billion in the Inflation Reduction Act is available directly for taxpayer services versus $45 billion for enforcement. So now uh, with divided government, it might be difficult to claw some of that money back, but it could be possible to take some of that money for enforcement and transfer it over to taxpayer services and to uh, improving the IRS's um, master file, which is, that's the core program that they use for processing all the taxes and is built on assembly programming language, with, which dates back to the 1950s and 1960s. And just a couple weeks ago, it was either TIGTA or GAO said that they have no timetable for completing the upgrade of the master file within the next decade. So that's something that needs to be heavily prioritized. And Congress could also work with the IRS to help set uh, benchmark benchmarking goals for meeting taxpayer service priorities. And if they don't make that, that could impact the uh, enforcement funding could be contingent on making sure that we're improving uh, things for the taxpayers. So as we're not sending, spending as much time laboring over taxes and trying to make sense of a complicated system. You know, it, it's we, uh, people who want the IRS to fill out your taxes for you, but then the IRS can't answer simple questions over the phone should raise, raise a big red flag about that, that idea going forward. So Damien, getting right into it, something that you just said that is interesting to me is the breakdown of the 80 billion that I, I've, I've, even though I do this for a living, I was shocked to hear that only 3.5 has been allocated for taxpayer services. My question is, um, the other number that's floating around in the memes that Nan mentioned, you know, the, the 87,000 new IRS agents, 
How how is that going to be apportioned? What, what what's the breakdown of that resource number for the IRS? So the uh, before the um, Inflation Reduction Reduction Act was enacted, the Treasury Department had put out an enforcement planning guide, and that's where the eighty seven thousand uh, dollar or eighty seven thousand new agents figure came from, and. It was a pretty straightforward document. It showed how many they're going to hire over the next decade, and it amounted to 87,000 new new agents. And now, after the IRA was enacted, uh, there was pushback against that figure, and then uh, people, their, uh, administration officials were saying, "Well, we're going to use a lot of that money for attrition because we're going to be losing a lot of employees in the next couple of years." Well. The IRS has been dealing with attrition for years and years. I think it has one of the highest attrition levels across uh, federal agencies. So they have been dealing with that through their regular budget. And there's one interesting line in that Treasury report where they said they're going to increase. The goal was to increase the annual uh, workforce of the IRS by 15 percent per year. And that's enough to accommodate for the 87,000 new agents uh, plus dealing with attrition. Uh, So back in February, uh, the IRS was supposed to have complied with a directive from Janet Yellen to co- uh, complete a planning report on exactly how they're going to use that money. That that report has been delayed, and the latest we heard from Secretary Yellen is that it is due in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully they will have some good baseline numbers in there showing what they had planned to do under current law and, and expected regular appropriations and what they're going to do with this additional uh, funding on top of that. Gotcha. So, Mike, you mentioned the low income tax trap and as as well as the ProPublica leaks. The ProPublica leaks were very much so uh, about uh, high income earners. Um, Those are the folks that can hire the accountants and the lawyers. So I think a lot of people are really concerned about the increased level of enforcement that Damon was talking about. Um, What is the low income tax trap? And can you can you just expand on that a little bit more and what potentially a significant portion of, of the, the, these new IRS resources going to enforcement means for that. Sure, and just quickly to, to address the audit number too, because a big part of the public debate as well has been uh, an attempt to comply with the president's promise that they won't raise taxes on anyone uh, earning less than $400,000, won't increase audits on anyone earning less than $400,000. Um, you've kind of seen there's a bit of a sleight of hand where we've talked about increasing audits or increasing the audit rates. Um, and that the audit rates um, will increase uh, is, is the promise we've had from Secretary Yellen. And it's the, the, the big asterisk on that promise is relative to recent years, um, where the IRS data is very vague on what the audit rates are in recent years, and the IRS isn't very forthcoming with it. Um, so on that note, too, I think it's important to highlight uh, that while the IRA was passing, there was a vote in the Senate, an amendment offered by Senator Kripo to prevent audits on individuals earning less than four, an increase in audits on individuals, individuals earning less than 400,000, uh, unanimously rejected by every every, every Senate Democrat. Um, so I think it's important to highlight that we did have one vote that would have prevented new audits on individuals earning less than 400,000 that failed in the Senate. Um, to your question on the ProPublica leaks, um, you know, and, and essentially I think the concern, um, part of which to highlight again, uh, the idea for a government-run tax preparation service, IRA has $15 million included within it. Uh, specifically the concern is that the IRS just simply does not know the reporting requirements um, needed to claim the EITC. So EITC, uh, you know, very, very complex. Um, This is, I'll I'll read a quote from the Progressive uh, Policy Institute. Uh, The IRS does not have the necessary information in its database to accurately determine a low-income taxpayer's eligibility for EITC. The EITC is based on a stew of residency, family relationship, and income limits with complex tiebreaker rules. And like a giant puzzle, it requires deep knowledge of the personal lives of people living in the same household or family unit with who else for how long and what their relationships and incomes are just to start. Um, so that's, again, not from a uh, conservative organization like ATR, but from a center-left organization. Um, so I, I think the real concern is just the IRS does not have the bandwidth, nor the ability or the understanding of people's personal lives required to, to claim the EITC. Uh, and what you would see as a result of that is people less likely to claim it, less, ta- uh, less uh, tax incentives going to lower income people. Gotcha. And already, if you look at the map, uh, ProPublica actually has a great map on this, the, where, where audits, the most audited counties are in the country. It's, it's disproportionately low income counties. Yeah. And you've also actually seen, I think there'd be a concern with this too, um, over who claims the ITC, you'd have a, dis, uh, a dis, uh, proportional impact on minority communities as well. So Nan, something that you talked about is a, a new licensing regime that the IRS is, you said, 
pushes for in just about every budget. So are we to understand that the IRS is both asking to essentially do your taxes for you and then make it harder for other people to do them? Yes, um, they are going after this in a, a few different ways. So yes, their ultimate goal is to do your taxes for you. Um, but in the meantime, let's make it harder and more expensive for you to do it yourself. Um, already, um, tax preparers, um, if they are not um, necessarily CPAs or with a large um, tax or accounting firm, have access to um, PTINs or um, preparer tax identification numbers and, and other safeguards that help the IRS track people. Um, you have to be approved to get this identification number. You can't have past um, convictions. You have to be in good standing with your taxes. Could, they can even check your credit. And of course, all the same rules around fraud and misrepresentation and things like that apply to any tax preparer. Um, but uh, the IRS would like to make it more costly and harder by saying you need to pay a fee to get this much better tax identification number and also 15 hours of continuing education a year, which for a small shop, often for retirees, this is seasonal work or um, for other small businesses, um, you know, they don't have the capacity to um, pay for or, or have the time to do additional um, education such, at, such that the IRS would require. Whereas if you're a firm, one, you're exempt from a lot of these new licensing recommendations, or you have the resources to make sure that your um, staff are in compliance. This would have um, the result of you know, increasing the cost of using a tax preparer, which as Damien laid out, so many people need to use a tax preparer because our code is so complicated. Um, and for other people, this is a good business for them and um, it would be taken away. Um. So, yeah, that's, uh, appreciate the point. The, I wanna get into now with each of you, you know, there's, we all want the IRS to work well. We all want, you know, as, as I believe you were saying, Nan, it to be not as much of a painful experience every spring as it, as it is for a lot of us. Um, and, you know, we all accept the fact that I don't think the IRS are, is going away anytime soon. Um, so this needs to be an organization that, again, the, the, the S truly stands for service. But there are some longstanding kind of cultural and, and structural problems within the IRS that I think do need to be addressed. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, the abuse of IRS power has cut against both sides of the aisle. Is, isn't that right? I mean, doesn't, doesn't this problem sort of date back to even the Nixon administration? Yeah, that was what came to mind immediately. Um, yeah, I think everyone gets to uh, or has used the IRS to um, different degrees um, and and that, that's wrong no matter who is doing it or why. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and I know there were some also some recent questions even about the, the Trump administration and certain people that were being audited under the Trump administration and then the, the Obama administration before that, just the suspect auditing uh, processes. Mike, uh, some of the other issues that we've heard and that you've talked about in your work uh, related to some st structural and cultural problems at the IRS is related to um, some of the way that some of the employees are spending their time on the clock, isn't that right? Well, yeah, so, so one of the things we've written about at ATR is essentially the amount of time the IRS uses on the clock, on taxpayer service for things that they're, allowed, like they're legally allowed to, like union organizing, I think is something that taxpayers would be surprised uh, that the IRS uh, spends a significant amount of time per month uh, doing when they're not answering phone calls. Um, again, I think the the uh, internal watchdog for the IRS, the uh, taxpayer advocate, their 2022 year-end report uh, had phone calls answered at 21% of the time that taxpayers were calling for taxpayer assistance. They actually got help. Only 13% of that was actually talking to a live person. Uh, now we've had you know Secretary Yellen testifying that those numbers have increased. Um, I've, I've only seen that claim from the IRS itself, from Treasury itself. Um, so I think it's a, a big wait to wait to see. Um, but on specifically on the taxpayer service question, I think it is important to know too that there, there's bipartisan support for this. We've had you know, the first uh, bill House Republicans voted on this year 
um, was largely to repeal the majority of the funding of the $80 billion funding for the IRS. That vote did maintain the IRA levels of funding for taxpayer service uh, and for business modernization. Um, so I think there, that is this area where I, I would certainly hope that if we're going to throw a lot of money out, we would see taxpayer services increase. Um, but I think, again, the, the concern a lot of people have is the proportion spending of, you know, when you give the IRS $47 billion to increase uh, revenue, where the, you, know, you basically have a mandated goal from the CBO score is to go raise $220 billion as you know, f- funded spending for the rest of the IRA uh, is, a, is a deep concern that we should have uh, given the cultural uh, problems the IRS has demonstrated uh, year over year for decades now. I mean, they're supposed to, uh, I believe we're now 20 years past the annual, where the IRS is supposed to give an annual report on simplifying the tax administration process. 20 years, uh, an annual report they're supposed to do, haven't done it for two decades now. So, Mike, the goals that have been set out for IRS as a revenue target is what you're saying. So now don't people get people to prepare their taxes for them to maximize the revenue, or maximize the money they get back? I mean, doesn't that sort of create a clear, like uh, almost a public choice problem that you have a, ta- a potential tax preparer at the IRS that is, is by law encouraged to try and keep as much revenue as possible? Right. You have in the private sector, you have a clear incentive is because you have different options to choose from of, of what service you're going to use. Their, their goal is to, is to maximize your return, where you have the government's goal will be to maximize revenue, which I think has now clearly been demonstrated after, again, we have a CBO score of how much the IRS is supposed to go raise from increased audits. So having them do your tax preparation service for you, again, it gets into that conflict of interest of you don't want the person preparing your taxes to be the same person who's going to audit you and manage your contested return. So Mike mentioned uh, the amount of reporting that would be required to comply with EITC uh, and, and, and tax preparation uh, done at the IRS. Um, but already the IRS is collecting a, a tremendous amount of information on, on a lot of folks. Um, Damien, I was hoping you could touch on just how much uh, at, at current levels that the IRS is dealing with and if perhaps they're just overwhelmed and that's contributing to a lot of the problems that we're seeing. Yeah, it's increasingly they're just vacuuming, vacuuming up more and more information. Uh, there's information that came out from the IRS uh, data book earlier this year that shows in uh, 2021, they collected over 4.6 billion dollars. Or I'm sorry, four. I can keep them all this some dollar signs in my head. Um, 4.6 billion dollar, uh, 4.6 billion electronic files, and that's a double uh, compared to a year ago. So if you look at the population, it's about 13 forms f- per person, and that's also about doubled over over the past five years. So, and on the one hand, uh, it can be beneficial, uh, as we saw during the government shutdown. Uh, where the IRS agents weren't going to work and, and uh, well, couldn't go to work, and people had trouble getting information into the IRS that they needed to file. At that point, there were certain forms that you can only submit by, by mail. So the IRS uh, did a good job by increasing the number of forms that you can submit electronically. Um, but as we saw with um, the original version of the Build Better Act, I wanted to have the financial um, uh, transaction Pretty much from any bank account, if it was if your inflow and outflow amounted to six hundred dollars, the IRS would get a notification about that, and so that would have vastly increased the number of, of forms flowing into the government. Uh, Ten ninety nine K, if if it's not reformed this year, um, it's difficult to to estimate, but it's going to be at least tens of millions of new. Uh, 1099 K forms going out to unsuspecting filers uh, are going to cause a lot of confusion for people, and as, so the IRS could use some of this data to better use. Uh, just last week in, on a panel, uh, the uh, former director, co- former commissioner of the IRS, um, Charles Rosati, was talking about how the IRS isn't fully utilizing a lot of this digital data that it has. Um, so one issue that they have is a number, high number of unchanged audits. So they have a division that's supposed to be looking at high income taxpayers and complex businesses. They go through these rigorous audits that can last a long period of time. And a large number of them are coming out at the other end without a change in the audit. So, I mean, so one, one goal to would be to reduce that, but you don't want the IRS just going through and adding on ticky tack thousand dollar charges here and there. That's that's not really good. They could use some of this data to better target the people that they think might be um, evading taxes, whether knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, but then there's also, of course, as they're going to get more and more uh, records. The cybersecurity concerns also increase as well. They're just sitting on all this data, and we want to make sure that this data is protected. And if they don't need all this data, perhaps Congress can take a look and, and scale some of that back. Yeah. 
If I could add, I mean, it, the fact that they do have all this data is um, one frightening from a, um, a data security perspective when we know that um, IRS staff um, access either accidentally or for nefarious reasons, files that they should not have access to all the time. And despite the fact that they have all this data and are getting more, the National Taxpayer Advocate has reported that there's an 81% false positive rate um, with their automatic system that flags um, returns for um, extra scrutiny and potential audits. So they have all this data, it's not making them smarter <laughs> or more accurate when it comes to um, finding where there are real problems and where there are real problems, people are considered a criminal rather than people who might make an error because things are very, very complicated up you know, to the fact that the IRS can seize assets without a conviction like so many other agencies, which is you know, in and of itself, a massive, massive problem. And this can quickly uh, become a problem for many people, again, particularly low income people who um, face the worst of this. So the last few remarks I'd like each of you to make, I don't want this to just be the, the Friars Club roast of the, the IRS. Uh, there's obvious problems, but I think the vast majority of the folks that are working at the IRS, the overwhelming majority by a long shot, are people that are just trying to do the right thing with really outdated or flawed parameters um, and flawed equipment and things like that. Um, and are increasingly getting new roles and responsibilities added to them. I think a lot of the, the headaches we've saw over the last few years were related to the IRS, not just becoming a collection agency, but also a distribution agency with a lot of the COVID funding that went out the door in terms of uh, the, the, um, uh, the stimulus plan, various stimulus checks. So my question to each of you would be, what are some things that we could do to make these problems that we, the very clear problems that we've identified better. What what can we be for, uh, assuming that, you know, as much as it may pain some of the folks in this room, uh, that we're probably not going to get all of that $80 billion back? I'll go first. Sure. Oh, yeah, so I think one of the things we mentioned was uh, some tying the uh, enforcement funding to IRS uh, benchmarks, specifically around taxpayer service. And um, we've seen legislation introduced by Senator Collins and Senator Thune uh, that would pretty much do exactly this. I want to, I might get it a little off, but essentially things like 90% of IRS employees being back working in person, answering uh, the taxpayer advocacy's uh, advocates threshold for calls, which I believe is around 85% of call volume being answered. Um, and just in this basic performance measures like that, we're ensuring the taxpayer service is increased uh, to levels before we have any talk of what the enforcement funding is. That's something I believe there's been bipartisan discussions around. Um, I think other things we've seen, Senator Grassley's introduced legislation uh, essentially requiring the IRS to submit an annual spending plan, uh, which is again something that they have not done yet. So the IRS has not told us how they plan to spend $80 billion, which is something I think there should be broad support over that they should submit that plan and the Treasury says that they will. So having uh, increased oversight from the Senate, um, from, from Congress, uh, and the ability of Congress to have a say in, in what that spending plan looks like. And Grassley's bill would potentially, I think, freeze spending for two months if Congress votes to reject the bill. Um, and then we've had, I think, bipartisan interest on fixing things like the 1099K, uh, the previous threshold of $20,000 and 200 transactions. Uh, we've saw, you know, during the year-end uh, omnibus spending bill discussion, uh, there was bipartisan uh, interest in, in raising the threshold, although disagreement over what we raised the threshold to. Um, but I think these are all things that there's legitimate uh, bipartisan discussions on. Yeah, and I like that uh, IRS report that you'd mentioned earlier in discussion where they're Make, we, let's, let's make sure that they follow through and report to, com, to Congress and the committees on the various uh, co uh, most complex parts of the tax code and the, the, part, the forms that cause the most headaches for people. And in addition to that, along with the hundreds of changes to the tax code that Congress makes each year, when they're doing this, they should bring in some of the experts from the IRS's taxpayer burden, the people who work at the IRS on the taxpayer burden model, bring them in so that they can uh, weigh in on the complexity and compliance burdens that these new changes might, might uh, impose. And another really good idea to help change the culture at the IRS would be to reconstitute and bring back the IRS Oversight Board 
This was created as in one of the IRS reform legislations uh, that was enacted in 1998. And it's supposed to provide outside expert advice on IRS's strategic plan and internal operations. And that would be a good way to get them change the, the culture and to focus a lot more on taxpayer services. Taxpayers uh, might not necessarily be customers because of the involuntary nature of the exchange, but they ought to be treated like customers. So if we bring back this board and there was a bipartisan legislation that would do this and revitalize it, uh, it's been defunct since 2015. It's, it's a shame that uh, this good entity has been on the sidelines for so long. Well, on top of simplify, 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 um, I would just urge Congress not to give the IRS new powers or authorities. TIGTA has said repeatedly that they have the tools they need to implement the laws that we have and that they do not need um, additional authorities um, to do so. So until, you know, every other problem is solved, let's not <laughs> give them uh, more authorities, then we can come back and, t and talk about that. But also, I think it's uh, really important, not only for the IRS, but for um, citizens' relationships with their federal government writ large, that um, an end to administrative forfeiture and other um, forms of civil asset forfeiture be um, eliminated or restricted. One good bill that has been introduced this year is the FAIR Act, H.R. 1525, by Representatives Wahlberg and Raskin. For a number of years, um, reforming and reducing um, civil asset forfeiture has been a bipartisan priority for, uh, for just many people in both the House and the Senate, but unfortunately, significant reform has not made it over the finish line yet. But at the end of the day, um, interacting with the IRS or any other um, federal agency outside of a criminal investigation should not be the end of anyone's um, life and income. All right. Well, with that, I think it's uh, probably time to close and make sure people can get some lunch. I just want to thank everybody for joining us, especially our panelists. Uh, as much as it may pain some of us in this room, taxes and the IRS are a reality in all of our lives. It's one of the few agencies, as Nan was saying, that we can expect to interact with directly in our lives. So it's imperative that it's using its resources wisely. For more on our work on this issue, I'd encourage all of you to come to uh, www.protectingtaxpayers.org and uh, please stick around. Feel free to join a discussion and please grab some lunch. But uh, again, thank you all so much for coming.